back on the line with us is uh, Alex Aronson. He is the former chief counsel to Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. He worked on judicial ethics, oversight and dark money issues, advised on the Supreme Court confirmation hearings of Justice Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. He's executive director of courtaccountability.org uh, on Twitter at Alex Aronson, A-R-O-N-S-O-N. Um, Alex, welcome, welcome to the program. Glad to have you with us. Do I have everything right on your bio? Yeah, you got it. Thanks, Tom. It's good to be here. Thank you for joining us. So uh, tell me, how how did right-wingers take over the Supreme Court and so much of the federal judiciary that we've got wackadoodles like Aileen Cannon down in Florida? Sure. Well, as, as you well know, and as I'm sure your audience is well familiar, uh, this is the product of a really like a 50-year scheme that was uh, born in the massive resistance. Uh, really, that's where kind of originalism and these kind of doctrinal projects really began as a way to push back against Brown versus Board of Education and uh, integration in America as um, social progress started to proceed. And then, you know, really sort of leveled up in the early 70s with the infamous Powell memo that was commissioned by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which gave the, you know, the captains of the titans of industry across the country a real blueprint for taking over this, you know, fundamentally anti-democratic institution and uh, leveling an agenda upon the rest of us. And, you know, I think that the critical thing they did, um, the, the, the brilliant sort of stroke of political insight was to galvanize a, an electoral base, of course, around the religious right and the, you know, long desired um, goal of overturning Roe versus Wade. And so this, you know, combination of interests, uh, you know, fueled by huge billionaire dark money, uh, brought us to where we are. And and when you know I was in the Senate working for Senator Whitehouse, uh, the Senate was just you know, you know, devolved into a um, you know a judge factory for these this new breed of extremist theocratic billionaire bought judges who, you know, we're now seeing you know just how much damage they can wreak on our society if yeah. we don't uh, stand up and fight them. Under under Mitch McConnell. Um, I, I think you could argue that in 2016, perhaps even the, the, the issue that marginally pushed Donald Trump into, into victory in the Electoral College, I mean, he lost the, the popular vote by three million, which should be a warning to all of us, but in any case, um, was the fact that Mitch McConnell was holding open Merrick Garland's seat on the Supreme Court, and a lot of Republicans who hated Trump or didn't, you know, didn't think he was credible or you know, he thought he was a worthless human being, basically, uh, nonetheless, went out of their way to vote for him because they wanted him to uh, appoint, you know, the Supreme Court justice uh, in, instead of Merrick Garland. And so, you know, here we had one political party essentially using an opening on the court or a potential opening on the court. This this was an actual real opening um, to to motivate their base. Can you think of a time when Democrats have done the same? And how might Democrats do that in this in this election? Um, you know, season here, and and do you see any sign that they might be motivated to do so? Yeah, you know, I think that's exactly right. It was this devil's devil's bargain that Leonard Leo, the executive vice president and board chair of the Federalist Society, made with Donald Trump, who I think you know they they didn't even like themselves. They just saw him as an easy vector for the confirmation of these new judges that they would be hand selecting to deliver their outcomes. You know, I had a meeting uh, with my old boss and, and Don McGahn, where Don McGahn effectively confirmed that. Donald Trump didn't care at all about who these judges were. They were just delivering, you know, judicial selections, and he would rubber stamp them. And no, you know, I think the answer is no. We haven't seen that from Democrats. We haven't seen that from the progressive advocacy community, because unlike the right, we have not invested in a politics of the Constitution. And in many ways, I think, you know, that that owes to the way many of the most important, you know, uh, progress was was produced in the 20th century under the Warren Court, which gave us these important rulings, uh, you know, Brown versus Board, and you know, of course, Roe versus Wade. And I think, in many ways, liberals have organized our constitutional politics around the defensive preservation of those wins, and in many ways, created a mythology around this court as the protector of the ma marginalized and the vulnerable. And as important as those victories were, and as that progress were, you know, I think we made a you know very bad strategic misstep in failing to do the hard work of securing those rights through the democratic process, through the Congress. And, you know, as a result, I think we have sort of stagnated in terms of our understanding of judicial power. And one of the real um, alarming things I saw in my five years working in the Senate was just how little uh, the, the members of Congress there, um, you know, thought hard about their constitutional offices and obligations and the powers inherent in them and what they could do to, to push back. How One thing I'll say is, oh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, no. And I was just going to say, in terms of where we where we could come from here, I think as horrifying and as destructive as as Dobbs was, the, you know, delivering that long sought goal of the re the reactionary right, 
You know, it has given us, I think, a real opportunity to understand judicial power, understand its threat, and to organize our politics around it. And I think we are starting to see that progress. We're speaking with Alex Aronson, the uh, executive director of CourtAccountability.org. Um, Alex, how did how did Mitch McConnell get away with holding open uh, Merrick Garland's seat on the on the Supreme Court for over 400 days? Uh, I, I'm still scratching my head on that. Why didn't uh, Barack Obama just pin him to the wall? I mean, you know what Lyndon Johnson would have done. Why? Why yeah. was? Why were Democrats not yelling and screaming? Why wasn't you know Dick Durbin and Sheldon Whitehouse on the news every night? Or were they? Well, Sheldon was. I think Sheldon was you know uniquely um, you know prescient about what you just see the writing on the wall, largely because he'd been tracking dark money deni you know, climate denial from his work on climate championship. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it, it reflected this, you know, cultural attachment we have to the court as a court and to this very clear power grab that McConnell was leveling with the, you know, norm breaking decision to deny Merrick Garland a vote. I think even the selection of Garland himself, you know, a sort of a milk toast centrist who was not going to motivate, you know, mar large blocks of voters to care one way or the other, whether he was confirmed to the court, uh, you know, reflected that misstep. And then one other thing I think, you know, it, which connects to your really wonderful rant that you, you know, read at the top of the, to the top of the hit, which is that, you know, I think that the corporate interests that, you know, um, have flooded our politics with money and made money the exclusive coin of the realm after Citizens United have really sort of trapped the Democrats such that they can't, you know, effectively serve the will of the people and protect the everyday person because, of the, you know, they need to preserve on some level the status quo that, you know, the corporate donors that keep them in office demand. So Dick Durbin is chair of the Senate. Judiciary Committee. The Senate Judiciary Committee has, you know, oversight power over the Supreme Court. Um, why, you know, you and I both know if Jim Jordan or, you know, uh, Comer, James Comer or one of these other guys were, were running the Senate Judiciary Committee and the shoe was on the other foot, they, they would be having public hearings. Uh, they'd be doing them on the street out in front of the Capitol building if they could. Why yes. is Dick Durbin uh, behaving like such a, a, a wimp here, I, you know, why is he? Why is is he afraid of these people? Is is it, don't rock the boat? I I just I don't get it. Do you have any yeah, insights into this? You you know this I guy. Think, uh I think I do. I know him. I've, I've worked very closely with his staff uh, over the years, uh, including, you know, in my time as an advocate on the outside. I think it reflects, again, this kind of cultural attachment to the court. I think he is he is afraid of being accused of, uh, you know, infringing uh, judicial independence by making an issue of the, the very fact that it has been so corrupted by these billionaire and theocratic interests. He doesn't want to deal with Republicans screaming at him. I think in many senses, he, he wants to sort of wave a magic wand and bring back the old world as it was, which worked, you know, fine for for Senate. Senators and, and allowed them to kind of get along with their colleagues across the aisle, but it never really worked all that well for regular people. And so, you know, in this moment, I think he's trying to sort of wish that world back, you know, more practically um, in the kind of day to day politics of the Senate. I think there's a very real and tangible sense that if they inflame tensions uh, on these judicial politics issues, Re Republicans are going to make it hard to confirm the last remaining vacancies that President Biden is trying to get through. And, you know, I, again, I think, you know, th while those uh, you know judges are very important, while I think Biden and Durbin deserve you know tons of credit for their eff excellent efforts to diversify the federal, federal bench, it's a short-sighted strategy, right? Just the way that court power works, these lower court judges will not have power to do anything about, you know, a, a durably entrenched 6-3 supermajority on the Supreme Court that has proven it does not care about precedent or principle. Yeah, yeah. What, what can we do about this? We, well, we really we need the average person, you know, the voters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and this and this gets to the work we're doing at Court Accountability to really drive a movement to you know not only expose and confront the threat of this captured court, help media see it more clearly. You know, I think so many you know media you know and even the Democrats still sort of look at this as like a court doing kind of court business. We need to sort of you know show the world that the emperor has no clothes here and drive some politics around this. Push somebody like Durbin who has this awesome power as judiciary chair to use that power to to not give away our people's congressional oversight authority, right? That is our oversight authority that he is conceding when the court tells him, no, you can't legislate, you can't oversee us because of the separation of powers, which is completely ahistorical and, you know, contrary to 
centuries of history. And so Article we need to push it, Section right? 2 of the Constitution, <laughs> yes, <laughs> which explicitly right. gives Congress exactly. that power. Exactly. Uh, you know. So, you know, I, I'd like to, you know, the, the Republicans on the committee, one thing I noticed was that, you know, a lot of these Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee in particular, they were like born in a Federalist Society test tube lab, and they came up with a real program rooted in a constitutional theory. It's nonsense, but they were gr making arguments, and we're just not anymore. Yeah, which is which is unfortunate. Hopefully, uh, Senator Whitehouse can can light a fire under uh, Senator Durbin. <laughs> yeah. I know he's working on it. I know uh, he's working good. on it. Good, Alex Aronson, uh, former chief counsel to S Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, now uh, running CourtAccountability.org. You can check it out. Alex, thanks so much for dropping by. Great talking. With you. Thanks so much, Tom. Have a good one. My pleasure. Thank you.